the reason it's so complicated and so difficult for a startup to sell into this is because, as I said way back, it's a complex web and IoT is new. Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. This is an episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series brought to you by GE Ventures. In the series, we explore success factors and challenges in industrial IoT markets with CEOs, investors, and experts. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight. I'm joined today by Derek Keraton. Derek is founder of IoT Forum. He is also in uh, wearing multiple hats. So Derek is also the managing director and principal analyst of the Keraton Group. He's the founder and chairman of Telecom Council of Silicon Valley, as well as the founder and chairman of Autotech Council. And Derek is also an advisor on both RCR Wireless News and MakesBridge Technology. Derek, the topic today is open ecosystems to support innovation in industrial IoT. From your background, you're the right man to be talking to. Before we dive into the topic, can you give a quick overview of of yourself and in particular, your role in these organizations and the background for why you decided to, to found these organizations and the value that they've created for you and then for the companies that participate? Thank you, uh, Eric. Good to be here. And thanks for the opportunity. First of all, I guess what we do here at those various organizations you mentioned, uh, Telecom Council, Autotech Council, and the IoT Forum being my three main uh, areas of focus, we try to build communities in Silicon Valley where we uh, source local innovators and entrepreneurs and startups, and we kind of give a light screening to them. So we find good ideas as they're forming, and then we take them to the big players in those different marketplaces. So if it were the you know, idea in the automotive space, uh, we have a variety of members in the Autotech Council, like car makers, Ford, uh, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Nissan, Peugeot, things like that. And we've filtered them good ideas in the automotive space. Same thing in the telecom space, where the larger companies, the network operators, the Ericsson's, the Nokia's, uh, you know, Orange, France Telecom, British Telecom, Docomo, you name it. We try to find innovations in Silicon Valley, in, in California, and bring them up more quickly. Our ambitions are to help these, these companies, both large and small, foster an ecosystem where innovation can reach the end customer faster and kind of bring the future and the benefits of the future to us a little more quickly. So we do that in those areas. And of course, lately, we've been doing it in the IoT space. And the ambitions there are very similar. How do we get innovations out to the marketplace as quickly as possible? Maybe then focusing on IoT Forum, how does this work in practice? Uh, the concept makes perfect sense. I think practice, much more complicated to effectively bring these companies together. Right. And so, you know, a lot of organizations that you know, claim to do stuff like we do, do it in a variety of different ways. And some of them are more, you know, successful and some of them less so. Uh, what we tend to do is kind of an age-old uh, technology. And it's basically mashing people together. So what we want to do is get the right people in the room and then uh, making it a dynamic in that room that uh, gives them a reason to connect engage, uh, you know, shake hands literally face-to-face as humans, and then maybe proceed on to the next level. The format and the structure, therefore, is we call them meetings, but other people might see that a bit as a mini conference. But think of a, a mini conference or a meeting of perhaps 100 people, and those people have all been focused along a topic line. So if it's in IoT, that's great. That's a little bit of a narrowing of you know, Silicon Valley down to just the IoT people in the space. But then we might take it a level further and say, today we're talking about agricultural IoT. And so people specifically interested in that uh, narrow sector would show up for that meeting. So already by having the people up and down the peninsula here in California, uh, up and down the Bay Area, say, well, that's actually relevant to me. Uh, I'm going to go to that meeting. Now the people in the room are interesting. They're startups who have solutions that they want to sell into the marketplace, and they are buyers who are active in agricultural uh, in, and the farmers and farm groups and cooperatives who are looking for interesting technologies in those spaces. And then we also have a host of middleware providers who say, ah, great, well, we can provide analytics on top. And then we'll have some hardware people who so say, I want to come there because I have some hardware, some sensors for ground moisture. So, so those people come into the room, they've been filtered by the content, by the topic, and we use our pretty big mail list to kind of get the word out that the meeting is happening. Once those 100 people in the room, this is not a huge meeting. Uh, you know, it's a small meeting where the, the people are encouraged to kind of meet everybody there that day. Then we have you know, your typical conference has people go up and do a 45 minute presentation and explain uh, what they're showing. Uh, we like to compress that. People here in California are pretty rushed up in the Bay Area. And also what we want to do is we want to let people explain what they do and then get off the stage and go start networking. So our presentations are very short, 
between seven and 10 minutes in our conference. And the great thing is, if you're interested in what the presenting company is saying, so maybe a startup is showing their new sensor that uh, is mentioned, senses ground moisture for agriculture use. If you're interested, great. You're gonna, when that guy walks off the stage during break, you're going to exchange business cards and arrange a follow-up. If you're not interested, well, you lost seven minutes. We're on to the next one. So that's the method of engagement. Uh, long breaks and encouraging people to network during those breaks and then giving the startups the opportunity to go up and kind of do their seven minutes. So it's not like a random networking thing where you have to work the room. You're going to go up and get your, your brief window of time, pitch what you have, and then anybody who's interested in connecting with that because that sensor is of interest to them will will join you at the break. And of course, we also do as an organization, we try to make sure and people say, hey, where'd that guy go? We'll walk people around the room and help them find that person. And if after the fact, uh, they say, listen, I met everybody I needed except for that one guy from that soil moisture sensor, we'll help people connect after the fact as well. The essence of what we try to do is make those connections happen for the next follow-up meeting. So we deliver everything up to that first significant one-hour meeting. So what we expect and what does happen after we provide kind of our engagement in the room we provide is those companies that are interested do have those one hour follow-up meetings. And in a number of cases, they actually follow on to have business relationships and contracts. Follow up here. You're in a very savvy part of the world, a very tech savvy part of the world where I imagine even, you know, farmers are going to be quite comfortable with technology. It's, it's too tech savvy, of course, but go on. I mean, and I mean that in a serious way. It's too tech savvy in the sense that often we build products that only we would like, uh, <laughs> but go on. And so I can see how this would work. You know, I'm based in Shanghai, also an interesting part of the world. But uh, if I try to explain, you know, uh, an IoT solution to a farmer, there's going to be a significant understanding gap. To what e extent are you wrestling with this, uh, and how do you how do you address this? How do you address the fact a lot of the technology that's coming to market is it's very um, complex. It uh, not only complex in the the root technology, but it might also be looping you know six or seven different technologies together into a system. So also complex from the system perspective, and then you have end users who are very traditional businesses. Do you play a role in this, or or do you expect the vendors to you know, basically figure out how to present their value? I'm beautifully insulated from the fact that the farmers don't actually know anything about what's being built for them, and they have to focus on their farming. Oh, we're we're I'm nicely up upstream where I'm connecting these technologists with these big companies that want to sell solutions to farmers. And that beautiful installation is one of the biggest problems that Silicon Valley can have. So we try to avoid getting in a mindset of, I'll let somebody else worry about that. And in fact, we try to communicate that throughout our membership and, and as part of the discourse at our meetings, whenever we have them, is we need to be thinking about selling through to the end customer. It's not enough for Silicon Valley. And I, I, mean, I said this, we're in a very tech savvy place and that's one of our curses as you were asking the question. We can keep building these products that maybe are great, but if you can't communicate the greatness to the end user, the product will fail. Uh, and then what's the global impact? What's the innovation impact on the world of, of products that were great but didn't go anywhere? It's, it's still zilch. doesn't matter how great it was in theory. So we, we like to step back and not just be, uh, you know, relish our insulation. That we, I don't actually sit down and talk to farmers very often. I do need to think about those different markets. And so in my organizations, what we try to do is actually, as I said, bring a farming cooperative or, or a, a large agribusiness to some of our meetings to say, here's what agribusiness wants and make sure that Silicon Valley is communicating directly with that uh, end customer. Now, to be fair, it's pretty hard to get the actual end user in the room here in Silicon Valley. And so I mentioned farming cooperatives and I mentioned agribusinesses. You know, when you talk about a small independent farmer, he's not flying up to Silicon Valley or Chicago or, or you know, in New York City or anywhere there's a big conference to talk farm tech. You know, where, where is he getting his technology? He's getting it from his local vendors. And um, that's why when we do talk to the farmers, we, we talk to cooperatives because they are a little larger. They do have innovation op, uh, officers and things like that that are out looking for the new technologies. And these will be kind of where the technologies first land and hit the ground. But so, uh, you know, really, that's what you've touched on one of the bigger challenges in IoT that uh, we're noticing when we contrast it to the other markets we work in, like telecom and automotive. And that is the, the, the nature of supply chain in IoT. So I want to shift. I think that was my answer to that question. We need to be very conscious of the end user, but it's tough to get them to get on a plane and come to a conference to learn about the latest tech. And realistically, it doesn't happen. So how do you, you know, how to get the message out? The, you need to, so let me, let me, let me end that first question. I, I kind of babbling here. So you're just switching topics, uh, Eric, as we go into this, um, I think. 
looking more generally at the supply chain, then, you know, again, if we look at this also as a, as a global ecosystem where you might have the sensors and a lot of the hardware being produced out of southern China, you have a lot of the software coming out of Silicon Valley, you have a lot of the, uh, the intermediaries maybe in the Midwest, and this supply chain is uh, it's complex and it's very immature. Right. So I think one of the reasons I stumbled back there is because we're mixing two very important topics. One is how do you communicate with the ultimate end user? And that's a big thing I honestly haven't got the answer for, but I'll share some thoughts later. But the one you're touching on that I do think I can open right now and deal with is how complex the ecosystem is here for business. And if I compare that to existing ecosystems like the automotive industry, and if you're a customer and you want to go buy a car, you know where to go. You go to a car dealer and you buy a car. So let's just use Ford as an example. You go to a Ford dealership because that's what you want pick up a Mustang, they're good to go. Where did the dealer get the car? Well, the dealer knows where to go. They look upstream. It's Ford Motor Company. So they have an arrangement with Ford as a franchise operator, buy the cars from there. Where did Ford get the car? Well, they're car makers. So they're the final, you know, they assemble them and they're the ones that sell them, slap the brand on it. But it turns out they get the parts from a variety of tier one and tier two automotive suppliers. And they know who those suppliers are and they work with them on a regular basis. And then the parts and sensors that go into those elements, well, the tier one and tier two suppliers also have their suppliers and their, their raw materials, you know, being steel, chemicals, things like that. Everybody up, up this value chain is kind of linear. Everybody knows where to look up the chain and where to look down the chain. Now, let's translate that and say, hey, does that work in the IoT? Well, IoT is a pretty new field, so it's not really hashed out like that. And it's not really that simple. And then also the additional problem, and I don't think it ever will be, because in an IoT ecosystem, it is not this supply chain. It's very much a web where if you want to assemble a solution, if you're a customer, you're a farmer and say, I want, to, you know, I want to make my farm a smart farm, what do I have to do? Well, there's a variety of hardware like sensors you're going to have to buy from somewhere. You're going to have to get a, a services provider who want, maybe can install those for you, who's going to provide you analytics and computer systems to make sense of the data that's coming off of that. You might want to go to another vendor like a John Deere to buy equipment to leverage that information. And all of these things have to be you know, integrated together. But you might say, well, I'm not a John Deere user. I actually use Mitsubishi Tractor. Okay, so they got a different provider, but you still want to use the same uh, smart solutions providers you have. You get, start to have this problem where you, know, you, you, are, you have to be cobbling together different solution providers to get the solution you want. And because of that complexity, it stunts the adoption of the market. If there's not a simple adoption process, for the average user, and the average farmer, they're going to sit, look at this and say, this is too complex. I'll just stick with doing nothing for now until it gets simpler. So that's the nature of it. We have this complex web where you can pick different solutions from all kinds of different people. Taking it back to the car thing one more time, if you buy a Ford car, you don't really choose your radio. You get the radio that, car, that Ford provides. You, know, you get the tires that Ford originally provides. That, you can obviously change those, but what you're buying is the th solutions that Ford provided. But if you want to build an IoT solution, usually you have to pick all those different pieces and assemble them yourself. That's the situation we're in today in 2017. Now, how do we solve that, make life easier for the customers? It is one of the major questions that we face in the whole I IoT ecosystem. If we don't make the solutions easier to implement and simpler to make the choices, people are going to get scared off and do nothing for a while. And only the most ambitious companies will start deploying IoT. And that's kind of who's doing it right now. I was at a conference where I talked about some of these subjects and I got a question from a guy who's in the plumbing industry. Turns out he's actually a private equity guy. And he's buying a bunch of different plumbers and he's putting them together and comes on what's run in the metropolitan area and have a lot of different plumbers under uh, one brand. Can I, let's just call it A1 plumbing, you know, first in the phone book, and things like that. He, he's saying, okay, as I, as I aggregate these different small plumbers into one business, I want to leverage technologies that make this organization more efficient. And IoT seems like a pretty good technology. I've heard people talk about connecting each one of these plumbers' vans, having an inventory of which parts are in each of the van as part of the system so that you know, this story is one plumber will go to repair a customer's problem in their house and say, oh, I don't have the part I need. Let me just launch into the system. And the system will tell him, hey, you know, the closest part is in Frank's van five miles away. Frank is 30 minutes from finishing his job. You know, do you wait for Frank or you drive to Frank's van to get the part or do you drive 30 miles to the warehouse? And because you can now go five miles to get the part out of Frank's van and return to your job, there's an efficiency achieved by that plumbing company. So this, this VC, who, the private equity guy who has learned about what IoT could do for him says, that sounds great. How do I do it? I haven't got a clue where to start. And he said, I've come to this conference. <laughs> it's an IoT conference. I've met dozens of people and I feel like I'm further away 
from knowing where to start than before I got here. <laughs> Basically, he's blinded by the options. You know, look, you can use any of these 100 different uh, sensor companies, any of these 30 different vehicle tracking solutions, any of these you know, 30 different um, Salesforce automation and analytics platforms and inventorying platforms. And you can use these 10 different system integrators. And AT&T wants to talk to you about connectivity solutions, but so does T-Mobile and Verizon and Sprint. And also some MVNOs like Eris want to talk to you about connectivity for your vans. It goes on and on and on. So this guy who was keen on the subject went to a conference and based, as I said, grew more and more confused and more and more reticent to launch into any effort because basically what he would have is um, he has the paradox of choice where there's so many choices that he'll feel like any choice he makes is bound to be not the best choice and therefore he might be frozen in his tracks. It's, and essentially, when you have that many options, there's no way you can invest them all, investigate them all. And the only thing you can be certain of is the choice you made is probably not the best one. And that's, that's a fact. That's just a statistical fact that you probably didn't make the best choice. So what we do is, as humans, we let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. And instead of building a good enough solution that you can just go out and build today, we're, you know, we want to build a perfect solution so that our CEOs, our bosses don't say, hey, why didn't you use X vendor? I've he- I heard they're better. And like, oh, man, I didn't even look at that. So this particular plumber, real story, a real guy that came up to me and he, and he, he asked me as I was on a panel, and then we had a further discussion after we got off the stage. And he, tr- he truly wanted to know, and he is representative of so many other farmers, plumbers, uh, factory workers, oil patch companies, like truly wanted to know, where do I start? And so I, I had some answers to him that I'd like to share w- with you on the, on the podcast here. But I think as an industry, we have to kind of share these answers with all of our customers out there. So the where do I start question. I think the answer has to be, once again, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. What you need to do is build a good solution and get out there and start leveraging it because there's ROI available. And you, know, you can iteratively improve on it. Yes, it's hard to swap out entire components, but it turns out you know, if you do something now, you'll have five years of, of, of learning and benefiting from that system. And then you can you know, reiterate in five years and say, okay, do we rip out what we got or do we build on it before you kind of double down and do another uh, medium-term reinvestment? How do you build that five-year p- plan for connecting to your plumber shop, for example, to IoT? Well, as a guy said, he doesn't know where to start. So I said, you got to just pick a starting position. You got to say, you know what? Uh, what's really important to me? Uh, the connectivity? Do I need my vans to be connected 100% of the time? Then start with a, a, a carrier who can argue for perfect connectivity. Is it the analytics? Do you just want the best analytics? Start there. So find an analytics company that says, we got a good analytics platform that works for services firms like plumbers. So shop just that. Don't shop everything, sensors, tracking device. Just start with what's important to you. Analytics, good. So you're going to pick an analytics firm and, go, and, and uh, go with them and say, okay, when you talk to that firm, you're going to ask, now that I like you for my analytics, who do you recommend for connectivity? Who do you recommend for vehicle tracking? Who do you recommend for sensors? Uh, you know, can do integrate with salesforce.com for my sales call. So start with that one firm and then find the recommended partners. Up and, down the, up and down the line. And what you build out of this complicated web is almost impossible for somebody to solve. What you build, at least, is a, is a virtual chain, right? You simplify it. You've picked the first, the, that vendor, which in this case is analytics, and you've asked them, what's your chain up and down? Or you know, I can build something that you're telling me I know is compatible and will work together at least, and I can get that as a starting position. And then, you, as I said, you can, you can take their advice or you can say, you know what, I have heard that Verizon might have better coverage in my region than Sprint, so I'm going to swap that element out and hopefully they can work to figure that in. But I'm basically going to take this recommended solution up and down. And that's a good way to kind of, you have to nail something down as a starting point. And that's kind of my advice to, to the plumber. But my advice to our industry and us is we've got to have these suggested solutions in place so that if somebody comes to you, you can say, ah, yes, I can sell you the sensors. I'm a sensor company, but I can also suggest who we connect with. You know, what, what uh, network tools connect well with us, which modems work well with my solution, which analytic solutions people are layering on top and you know, find our good partners. So you have these recommended partners up and down. None of it mandatory, but if somebody comes and says, I would like a turnkey solution, you're able to offer something akin to a turnkey solution. So that's, that's my recommendation for industry. And, uh, and then... Hopefully, we, we get over this huge educational hump. But my, as I said, my expectation is that at no point in the future does IoT 
become as simple as the automotive industry, for example, which by the way, isn't a simple industry, <laughs> simplified it down. But IoT will always be even more complicated than that. Great answer. I think this is um, something that every company does need to one internalize, but also communicate to their customers and their partners. One of the things that you know, we, we interact a lot with startups at IoT One and Many companies, even even as they progress towards the growth phase, have kind of an open uh, horizon for what industries and what needs they serve. So you ask them, "Are you, you do you serve the oil and gas industry?" Uh, yes, we do. Okay, what uh, reference customers do you have? Well, we don't have any yet. But we, you know, our technology is very applicable to oil and gas, right? So everybody has this, uh, or, or many companies have this perception that their technology is very horizontal, which it might be technically. But if they're not able to um, focus on a specific customer and say, this is the customer that we're serving, even though um, many other companies could potentially use our technology, it becomes then very difficult for, for customers to prioritize because everybody is basically telling them that our technology can help you to solve your problem, um, even if we've never you know, helped a similar company solve that problem in the past. Uh, so this is something I think as a, yeah, certainly as a, as a collective, we have to uh, get better at in this, uh, in this you know, domain of IoT, which is just very early. So companies are, are kind of figuring out uh, where they want to focus right now. I think, Eric, you know, that's a fun question because you you've hit on kind of one of the perennial challenges for a startup. And there's, you know, a couple of things that, you know, experienced startup people probably know is that you have, you might have a technology that's horizontal, but, and, and you can say, oh, we could, yeah, we could do oil and gas. Oh no, we could do, uh, you know, municipalities and water. Oh yeah, we could do, um, you know, fl- flood prevention and things like, and you, you can easily say, oh, we could do all those things. And as a startup, you need to be nimble and you need to be able to say yes to any reasonable demand a customer has because you need those early customers. So the flexibility, if you truly have a horizontal technology, you, you kind of want to say, yes, 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 we can do all these different things. But the um, paradox is that as a startup, you cannot do biz dev that way. You can't go to every conference, like the automotive conference, the municipality conferences. You can't try to do biz dev with all of these people because the resource requirements for having you know, biz dev staff and sales staff would be way too high. You blow all of your startup money trying to get the word out to all of these shotgun scattershot uh, different industries. You need to be more focused as a startup and spend fewer resources on biz dev. So the paradox is that while your technology, you want to be as broad as possible and you try to talk a broad story, as you actually get that uh, whittled down to a sales message or a marketing message, you need to talk to a specific industry and you need to have a good message that, that resonates with that industry. And you, so you need to make sure you're actually having conversations with people in that industry. You do go to the conferences, you do meet with them, so that you can actually speak their language and make sure that you're addressing some of their real needs. So, you know, as I said, it's just, that's why it's a paradox. A, a startup needs to be very flexible on technology and very focused on biz dev. And I think what, the way that happens is, it, it, frankly, it, the, I, you say these big and I wear many hats. They kind of need to wear many, hat, many hats. And it might seem kind of uh, like they're being fake at first, but this is the life of a startup. Make a, bro- a technology can be broadly applicable and then say, no, we're just for the gas industry. We're all about the gas industry. You double down your biz dev on the gas industry and you try to get a uh, beachhead in something and get some established clients. And then later in phase two, yeah, you go to different industries because you, now you have the resources and you're growing up and you can actually use the gas industry success as a reference case. Uh, plan B, of course, is you didn't make any sales in the gas industry. So maybe you go find another industry and you hope you have enough funding to last that. That often happens, right? But, but I think, as I said, people who are experienced in startup will know you can't do biz dev across the board. You got to focus on a certain customer case. So that continuing on with that, so let's assume the startup is doing it right, has a broadly app- applicable technology, but has focused their biz dev message down to what they hope are the correct target audience. And they're focused on them and they're giving them time and they're spending resources getting the messaging right for that target audience. So once they pick that target audience, then they get back to what we talked about before, where they're going to build up a more complete solution. And this, again, this is why a startup can't do it across the board. By build up a complete solution, I mean, if you're back to making that one agricultural ground moisture sensor. And that's what you're trying to sell. And now you're talking to agricultural potential customers, cooperatives, agribusiness. And you're you're talking to them and say, I got a sensor. They're going to say, great, but that's not a solution. So you're going to, as a sensor maker, going to have to work across the board with other people that can integrate your sensors into their complete solutions. So maybe it is John Deere. Uh, So you're going to have to have a a range of partners and you're going to have to go to that end market with this suggested um, implementation plan. So yeah, we got great sensors for you and 
if you choose to use our sensors, here are the additional vendors we recommend you work with. They put together a great solution with us. So you need to build up you know, partners in that area of agribusiness if that's the one you choose to focus on. That says no small feat. And this is the reason it's so complicated and, and so difficult for a startup to sell into this is because, as I said, way back, it's a complex web and IoT is new and there's a lot of education you have to do. And frankly, this is why when there's new, new uh, waves of technology like IoT, there will be a lot of, um, a lot of bodies uh, left in the field. Like there will be a lot of dead startups uh, because there's a lot of, you know, the slow education process right now because we're early in the game. So this is advice for startups. If we look at the larger companies, you've explained you know, their, their role in this in terms of uh, identifying the right technology that's coming out of startups, being able to help those startups commercialize, develop this into solutions that are, are communicated to the end customer and, and help to ease that adoption. Can you give us an example of one company that you see doing a particularly good job at playing this role of surveying the technologies that are coming to market integrating them into, into real solutions that are you know, maybe not plug and play, but, uh, but at least can be communicated to customers? Yeah, Eric, I, I can, in fact. And I think, uh, you know, I'm just going to pick a solu- uh, of, uh, an example that is a horizontal solution. Because frankly, that's the ones that you see most often, that I see most often. Um, so I'm going to mention for uh, AT&T. And they've got a device that is a sensor unit uh, that's, of course, connected to the AT&T cellular network. It can roam around the world. And the idea is this sensor can measure uh, temperature, vibrations, uh, light, and a variety of things. So it has all this sensing capability built into it. It's kind of one-size-fits-all package. And this is why it's horizontal. You could take this thing, you could slap it inside a shipping container, you could put it on an expensive piece of equipment, say a Caterpillar a bulldozer or something like that. You could put it in a ref- refrigeration truck and monitor the temperatures in there. And the idea is that the, you can buy this from AT&T. It comes with connectivity. It comes with all those sensors. AT&T provides you some preferred partners in terms of the analytics. Uh, so you can track your vehicles as they're driving around with these refrigerated units. You can ha- track the temperature. You can you know, have uh, alarm situations put into the software. So AT&T is coming at you with kind of a complete solution. That little hardware bundle they've got is enclosed. It's already got the radio from a radio provider. For example, it could be Ericsson or somebody else. It's got the sensors from a variety of sensor providers and probably a circuit board as well that they probably assembled through a partner. So they put together a whole lot of partnerships already in the hardware. They add their connectivity as a service and then they recommend the analytics and cloud layer on top of that and have a variety of people you can choose from so that you can kind of go to them and pick a complete solution if your needs are horizontal, right? And that's great. Now, I know this podcast is being sponsored by GE, so they're, they're a great example to bring up as well. But this is going to be a much more verticalized solution that is less familiar to people because you know, these vertical things are usually, this is kind of inside poker, inside pool rather, inside baseball for, um, for the industries at play. But if you look at something as complicated as a jet engine, maintenance on those is very important, obviously. Uh, we don't want to have them die in, in, in flight. And it's also very expensive. And just because of the nature of a jet engine, the way it's constructed, it's very deep and there's a lot going on behind a series of blades. So to actually work on the interior of the engine is uh, pretty expensive. So what you can do for an IoT solution is you could put a series of uh, sensors inside the engine that can sense different uh, failure conditions and prevent them from occurring or sense them before they occur. And then you, you can also, so you have to get those sensors provided from by a sensor maker, right? And you integrate them into the engine which could be a GE engine. And then you need to provide a service on top of that that airlines can use to monitor the condition of their engine. So you can do that as a service to the airlines. And of course, ultimately, uh, this serves the general flying public and give, you know, gives, uh, gives us cheaper airfares and a higher level of safety at the same time. Pretty strong benefits by monitoring the internals of the engine. So you, know, you can get these very verticalized solutions that, that uh, you know, would not maybe be a national story uh, and you wouldn't see them at every AT&T retail store. And you get those great horizontal solutions that the average person could walk into a store and go, hey, what's this little box? And, oh, that's something we've got for IoT. You know, the guy at the store could tell you. And you think, yeah, that might actually apply. I mean, I'm a, I, I run a, a locksmith and I got four trucks in town. I'd like to monitor where they are. That's a simple solution. Bang, I'll put that on there. Interestingly, uh, you know, I asked, hey, what's the light sensor for? Like, what, what do people need to do for monitoring light inside a container? thinking, you know, are there plants going in there? Or, uh, and the answer is actually interesting. It's, well, we, there's a lot of shrinkage during shipping, right? So if you put a shipping container from uh, Shanghai to uh, where you are, 
Shenzhen to uh, New York City. It goes across the ocean and it hits the port, uh, let's say Los Angeles, Long Beach, and then gets you know, thrown on a train or a truck, truck across the country in New York. There's a number of opportunities for somebody to tamper in, in with uh, the shipment and take something out of it. You know, a couple of uh, uh, laptop computers or air conditioners fill out the back of the container. The light sensor is mostly for knowing when the doors were open. So if you're worried about shrinkage, you know, first of all, you can you know through the tracking where your container is, you know if it's had severe vibrations so that if a bunch of your air conditioners inside are broken, you might be able to bill it back to the shipping company saying, what happened Sunday at 10, 15 a.m.? Seems like my container was dropped. <laughs> but importantly, if the, if the door is open, you know when. Now, let's say you, you take those vibrations and you just kind of record those into a log. If the air conditioners come out of the box just fine in New York City, you don't care that the vi- vibration occurred. If they're broken, you might use that log. But the light is a little different. Let's say that when you put you close container doors in Shenzhen, you activate an alert that says, if you sense light, notify us immediately. So that, uh, you know, two weeks later, that container is in a truck rolling through Utah. That's why in New York City, stop for unusually long amount of time, and the light sensor indicates there's light inside the container. You might be able to immediately react and uh, you know, call police and say, hey, I can go have a look at this, or call one of your agents and immediately contact the trucker and go, either you or somebody else has opened that truck. <laughs> so could you please verify that nothing is missing? Uh, so you can immediately react to that shrinkage problem uh, through an alert. So there's all kinds of things you can do with that horizontal uh, sensor solution. Pretty neat. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, great examples. Um, the GE1, I think, it- in particular, a great illustration of your point of the need to focus, because if you're this sensor manufacturer that wants to set into a, sell into a jet engine and you, you believe you have a horizontal technology, you've got to be 100% focused on the aerospace industry or GE is not going to have the, the confidence in you uh, to bring you on as a supplier, even if, even if it's applicable to other areas. We see a lot of that, what you just said, we see a lot in the automotive industry where people make some really good uh, sensors or consumer electronics and say, oh, we could put this inside of a car. But the requirements for an automobile are, you know, everybody wonders, why does this car stereo cost, you know, $2,000 when I can buy the same thing or, I can, you know, I could slap an iPod in my car for so much less. And the reason is, you know, you cycle that iPod or iPhone out every two years, but hardware that goes into cars needs to be able to last at least 11 years or more. It needs to be able to function in temperatures ranging from uh, minus 40 Fahrenheit or minus 40 Celsius all the way up to, you know, 150 Fahrenheit. So the tolerances and the vibration resistance are huge. So yeah, you need to be focused on an industry to give them specifically what they need. Last question, make versus buy. So you've created ecosystems in Shanghai. We've also created ecosystems. Large companies sometimes make uh, the decision to you know, start, a, start a consortium around a particular technology or to fund the foundation of, a, of an industry um, a consortium. Many other companies prefer not to, not to start their own or participate in the, the founding of a new organization, but they'll, part- you know, they'll participate as members in multiple how do you view the the basic make versus buy decision around an ecosystem? When does it make sense to craft your own, and when does it make sense to spread your resources and participate in multiple? I think there are times when it makes your sense. Uh, in general, I like open ecosystems, and I find that if you look long term, uh, they're often the ones that have the most success. So, Windows versus Apple, as an example, and of course, it's not the only one. Um, but there are examples where trying to you know, shoot the moon, basically trying to run the entire ecosystem yourself, pays off. And the iPhone. Uh, you know, Windows versus Apple uh, is one example, and then iPhone versus Android is a different one, right? Where Android definitely wins the shipping uh, numbers contest over iPhone. iPhone wins the profit numbers, so it's very profitable for them to to run vertically. So here are the things you need to see if you, you need to have if you want to run vertically and try to divide the entire solution. First of all, you need to be well capitalized, big business, because a startup just can't come out and do a vertical solution with any kind of credibility. We talk about how you have to f- you know, focus to get the, your resources, and you can't do every step of a vertical solution and, and provide the supply chain yourself. You know, If you're a sensor company, you can't go out and build the enclosure, then build the radio, then build... You've know, you got to have partners. You're not going to build a network and, and be a network operator that provides connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you have to be super large if you want to shoot the moon, so to speak. And then the other thing is you have to have a credible play like where people can identify your brand and it makes sense in that space, that really helps a lot. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're John Deere, for example, you might have some good credibility if you wanted to build a vertical solution for the agricultural industry. If you are immersion technologies who provide haptic sensors for phones and do a great job at that, well, if you want to say, hey, we got a great haptic sensor for, uh, for some agri thing, we want to go shoot the moon, people will go, yeah, I don't see you as a strong player in the agribusiness space. Um, that's not really a credible play. So you got to have 
credibility. So and I'm up to two, capital and credibility. And um, the next thing is you have to have competent solutions across that whole range. You can't have, you, you might have the best sensors. Uh, you have to have a competent solution in terms of connectivity, in terms of uh, analytics and things, if you want to provide the vertical thing. It doesn't have to be best at every step, but it has to be competent. It can't be bad. And that's where you know, things usually fall apart because customers go, why, do I, why are you locking me into your crappy analytics platform uh, when there's much better ones available? I love your sensor, but I'm not going to buy it because you're locking me down. That's where you start losing it if you can't be competent on every level. So capitalize, competent on every level. And then the third thing is, I would say early ecosystem. So, so if it's early in the ecosystem, sometimes it's good to provide the vertical solution because education becomes easier. And remember back to that story I told you about the plumber who's who, uh, the, actually a private equity guy who bu- was buying plumbers up, didn't know where to start. Well, if you can go with one turnkey solution, say, listen, you don't know where to start. I can give you turnkey, start to finish, total solution from, my one, from one vendor, one, one uh, throat to choke if you have problems. That customer is going to like that. So early in the ecosystem is a good time to try to shoot the moon. Uh, so basically, in, I, in the IoT, industrial IoT and home and everything, we are early ecosystem. So a lot of people are tempted to try to shoot the moon because of that early element. The question is, do they have the other two things I talked about, uh, credibility in the space and adequate capital and competence uh, across uh, all things. In fact, it looks like I got some Cs. I can make four Cs. Credibility, competence, capital, and, uh, and I don't early ecosystem. Well, I got three Cs and an E. I guess I have to work on that before I write my book. No, it's a good point, but it, very, very few then companies can uh, can meet these criteria, right? Even on the competence level, I, we, I guess we've seen a lot of the companies that have been traditionally quite vertically oriented around electrical and mechanical engineering solutions. Uh, now they're finding that there's this big competence gap in analytics, uh, you know, IT um, connectivity, uh, which are areas that they didn't have to deal with uh, previously in their vertical uh, solution. Yeah, and it, it's you know, it's the you know, the history repeating itself. So you know, one of the biggest in the high tech world, one of the most well known stories is the Route 128 Massachusetts versus uh, Silicon Valley battle. And the way Boston companies made computers back in the mainframe days, tandem computer and DEC and things like that, is they fully integrated. They made their own computers, you know, silicon for the processors, all the way down to the keyboards were made by the, the company. And they made you buy their keyboard, it had a specific plug. And, so and uh, that was great because early in the ecosystem. But as the ecosystem uh, developed and flourished, grew, people started going to best of breed solutions and integrated solutions that were based on open standards, like a PS2 port for a keyboard. Great. Now I can buy a cheaper keyboard than the one DEC was trying to sell me. So the Route 28, 128 model lost out to the Silicon Valley model of get your processor from Intel, get your you know, box from Dell, get your cooling fan from somebody else, et cetera, et cetera. So the, that open ecosystem is uh, long term is usually the way things go unless somebody manages to truly lock it down well. So if you look back in, you know, we're talking IoT, we're talking industrial IoT, but let's talk briefly, you know, smart home and home IoT stuff. You look at a lot of players right now trying to jump and be the dominant player in that space. Uh, and most obvious ones are Amazon through Alexa, Google with uh, Google Home product, and anyone else who's kind of trying to jump in and play in that space as well and a little bit behind those leading too. But these people have got the notion of, hey, you know what the best way is to get out there quickly and offer a pretty comprehensive solution. But you'll find that even those guys like Amazon, who's a pretty, you know, do they have credibility? Do they have uh, capital? Yes and yes. Um, they're trying to be very open as well. Like we want Alexa to be the front end that people integrate and work with to work with their smart home, you know, tell Alexa to open the doors, tell Alexa to turn on the lights. But they want to be very compatible and open so that it can turn on lights from Lutron, lights from Levitron, and a bunch of other providers all at the same time. So even players like that are saying, okay, well, we're going to do what we do and let and then make open APIs and partner with other people. And what you'll find is that's a smart way of building it. And those companies have said, where is the real profit and value? And they're saying, hey, it's at the front end that interacts first with the consumer. So if we just do that really well, we can be open and let other people bring the other parts of the solution and share uh, ecosystem revenue with them, but I mean, we might be at the uh, more profitable side of that equation. So that's what's going on in, in the uh, smart home right now. That's a great point to, to round us up here. Last question, very quick. What is one company that you've seen in the past 12 months in the IoT space that you'd like to put a spotlight on that you think is doing great things, but people might not know what they're bringing to market? You know, it's okay. I got an example that I love. I got, I got like a startup crush on this company called Sutro.ai. 
And I, I got no interest in them and I can't explain it. That's why it's a crush. It's, uh, but I, well, I do like their products. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. And um, if you're a pool owner, this will make sense to you. Otherwise, it may not seem too good. But so uh, it's a device you throw into the, your pool and it bobs around like chlorine dispensers often do. But what it's actually doing is on a periodic basis, it's measuring your water and doing the same thing the pool owners do where they basically pour drops of solution in and measure uh, the colors that come up to determine the pH level of water, the uh, alkalinity in their water, and the chlorine uh, res- levels in their water. So this device does it in, uh, you know, periodically, as I said, as it floats around in your pool. And uh, then it uploads those either, and they're, 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 it's a startup, so they're not fully fleshed yet, but they're either going to work with Sigfox for longer range connectivity so it can reach pools in the backyard, or they might provide a Wi-Fi solution, which sometimes has trouble reaching the backyard pool. So it's going to upload those to a cloud, and the cloud is going to be able to tell you uh, how to manage your pool. And the reason I have a crush on that company is because I currently waste a lot of time and money forgetting about my pool and, and then remembering it, putting in too much chemicals. And you know, it's, they say, oh, you're supposed to put in a bit of chemicals. Don't put it all in at once. I don't want to keep coming back to my pool five times. So I just throw it all in at once. I'm over. And a lot of pool owners do this. You know, and then you put in too many chemicals. And so, so by having a smart connected pool, basically having your, the water in your pool connected to the internet and the cloud and having an AI uh, service by Sutro monitor that water and by the way, it knows the capacity of my pool. It knows what's in my water through some early you know, initial measurements and such. I'm going to get text messages say, hey, Derek, looks like your uh, pH levels are a little high. Put in three quarters of a cup of this chemical and you should be good. So it's going to give me precise measurements. Tell me how much to do. And also tell me when to do these things. So I'm going to kind of be able to forget and just get alerts on my phone that say, put this in now. So I'm going to be putting in fewer chemicals at the right time probably even after I pay them, saving money. To me, that's, that's the great kind of solution where it makes my, my life easier and saves me money and pays for itself. So I like that company a lot. And the other thing that's cool about them is they're using their sensor. They're basically the, t- the chemical uh, sensing technology they developed also in some agricultural uh, uh, endeavors and stuff. So they're, they're active in both pool and spa and agri business. So cool startup to look for, sutro.ai. Cool, love it. Derek, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure. Been great. How can people get in touch with you or learn more about what you're doing? Sure. Well, one of the best ways to get in touch with us is to just look at our website. So Silicon Valley IoT Forum. And uh, you know, if you're interested in the stuff we're doing on telecom side, telecomcouncil.com and also autotechcouncil.com for the auto stuff. And uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Derek Curtin. All right. Have a great day, Derek. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at IoT1.com. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Ventures in Industrial IoT series. You can learn how GE Ventures goes beyond funding to support their partners in technology development and commercialization at www.geventures.com.